Good afternoon. It is just after one. I think we're actually on oh, close to being on time today. One minute past one. Uh, welcome to today's Hub Live coming to you via Zoom, but very live from the Smart Hub. Um, as you know, we do these Hub Lives to share stories and information that could help you, the business owner and our business community, uh, really uh, implement in your own business so that you can essentially steal some of our ideas and implement them in your business and hopefully, uh, not hopefully, they will then help you make the whole business, business journey more sustainable, more viable and more successful. And so today we have a wonderful guest, Mr. Matthew Doyle. Hello, Mr. Matthew Doyle. How are you? Hello again. Yeah, Very good. Again is good. living the dream as always. Oh, that's awesome. And um, Matthew says hello again, because you, you're no stranger to Hub Live. So you've done a couple before. Um, so thank you so yeah. much for agreeing to be back on Hub Live. And the reason why I've asked Matthew to join us today is because he has actually turned a personal problem into a business and not just a business for the sake of business, a personal problem that he knows many people who have this a similar situation would be struggling with. He wants to share the solution so that it can help other people improve their lives so that not only you can be living the dream, but other people can be living the dream too. And so what we'll be sharing today is a little bit about the journey that you took from um, experiencing this problem in the first place to how you know now turning this problem into an opportunity not just for you and your family but also for other people just like you so I'm super excited about today so I'll let you introduce what we're talking about what is our topic for today so our topic for today is we're talking about a, a new what we might call software product called diabetes dashboard and the key to diabetes dashboard is we want it to be an all-in-one personal diabetes management platform um, so that it can really improve people's ability to, to manage and care for their own diabetes and that of family members and other people um, so like right across the care network for the person with diabetes. Um, but we also want to empower people to improve the, the quality and the access to diabetes care management and education right around the world, particularly in places where they can't, don't have the kind of access we have to the great care and, and uh, medical support. Okay, absolutely. Excellent. Okay, so let's, let's talk about diabetes to start with. It's a really big problem. It's a global problem. And for people who have to live with diabetes, it impacts your life, doesn't it? It really does. Um, and it's not just the person that lives with diabetes, it impacts an awful lot of people around you as well, um, are, you know, in your family and in your broader personal network. Um, when we talk about diabetes, obviously, we've got to sort of break it up a little bit. So there, there's type one diabetes, which is the, you know, it's not the lifestyle kind of inflicted version if that's what yeah it's a really crude way of putting it but that's not it that's kind of you know um where the body itself has just for whatever reason um you've ended up with diabetes whereas type 2 is the one when someone says diabetes we're often thinking type 2 uh, which is which we can trace to diet and lifestyle factors or, or at least they can play a big part uh, and then there are other forms like gestational diabetes and that sort of stuff as well um, so for me, the, the catalyst was obviously a personal connection to type one diabetes through, through my son and his diagnosis. Okay, so, so, so just, I'm going to pause you. So go back even like five or six years, was yep. diabetes on your radar at all? Was it something that you ever thought about? No, I mean, I knew, uh, we, you know, we knew a young guy in church that had type one diabetes and we sort of knew a little bit about how that had affected him. And, um, and I'd actually worked with him and sort of seen him, you know, have a low here and there, but it was still something that was over there. It didn't really affect your own world. So you knew it was a kind of a big deal for somebody that dealt with it, but really didn't understand it or, or just what a big deal it was. And so when did it really become personal for you? When did diabetes come into your life? Well, the, the, uh, the exact date that it became really personal was the 5th of June, 20, what are we now, 2020, so 2018. Um, that was the day that Levi was diagnosed. But obviously it started, we started to see an effect leading up to that. So it became personal when we had a diagnosis in our own family and you know, it was our, our son. Um, and so he was, you know, in the lead up to that diagnosis, there was kind of the, the telltale signs, that, you know, the excessive thirst and constantly going to the toilet. Looking back, there was weight loss that we probably didn't pick up until we kind of, he'd been diagnosed. We looked back and went, yeah, you know what? He has, has lost some weight. Um, you know, lethargy and all these kind of things that these telltale signs that they tell you can be signs of diabetes. Um, I'm fairly thankful that, uh, well, not fairly, I'm very thankful that, that Veronica, my wife, who has just had some experience probably through her role as a teacher, was aware that these could be symptoms of diabetes. And that may have been what was going on. 
because for me that the, wasn't registering. I was kind of, you know, I look back now and sometimes I feel a little bit bad because I was kind of the father of the child who was just getting frustrated at the amount of drinking and peeing in the middle of the night and that kind of stuff. And mm. it wasn't straight away, it wasn't registering early on that, that it, this was actually a real problem. And thankfully it did with, with Veronica and we were still able to catch the diagnosis early. Awesome. Now, Levi is a gorgeous boy. He was three at the time, right? When he, he got was. diagnosed. Yeah. Show us a photo of Levi. Show us a photo of your beautiful family. And then we can kind of see. So Veronica, your wife, is a teacher. And That's so right. she had an inkling that something wasn't, well, you both knew that something wasn't right, but yeah. you didn't realize what it was. But she had an inkling that it might have been diabetes, right? That's right. Yeah. So she had so a fair idea that that was probably the case. Yeah. Awesome. So what happened on the fifth? So the fifth, what yep. happened specifically? So it was still a normal day. We'd booked in, we made an appointment to go and take Levi to my GP that, that afternoon after work. Um, I was due at a, a board meeting that night. Uh, and we uh, you know, just came to work like normal, went home, picked him up and took him into the doctor. And uh, the, the, they sort of went through the process of, you know, went through the symptoms as you do with a doctor and took him off and um they you know it went first did a, a urine test you could see that there was there was sugar present so then it went to the finger prick test um and i can still remember to today the number was 33.1 so if you're ever sure you know what a, a blood glucose reading should be 33.1 will, will scare you um because yeah, what's so, normal normal is between four and seven right four, I don't know four and number. seven for a normal it, not for a normal person four and seven is normal for a person who doesn't have type diabetes yeah, yeah, um, yeah so you know levi now that we we know he's got it we tar we target six and we're looking at a range of say four to seven five to eight that kind of thing but so he was 33.1 um at the time they couldn't do what a ketone check so anybody that's familiar with the keto diet will know you know about ketosis well with diabetes um you know the inability to absorb blood sugar can lead to di uh, diabetic ketoacidosis which can be incredibly bad so that's the thing that we caught before it but before it happened um so we sat down with the doctor and he sat down and he said you know it is a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes and at that point i wasn't overly shocked because we'd already talked about that could possibly you know almost prepared for that was what we were going to get but i still didn't realize what a big deal it was and so he said you know we need to take him to hospital and i remember asking you know okay do you want us to sort of take him up tomorrow that's sort of case and he said no no do you need me to call an ambulance for you um and that that was the moment where we kind of where or for me at least i went okay this is a much bigger deal than i realized it, it was even at that point um and so yeah from there we, we went home and we got him to hospital and there we stayed for a week and and went through what i what felt like a master's degree in diabetes management because they just throw everything at you and because once they let you out the door of the hospital you've got to manage this thing so um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, hey, Daniel, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you on our Hub Live. If you have any questions for Matt, anything around diabetes, and also this is would be one of your, I'm right up your alley. Um, Matt's going to share how he built the platform using bubbles. So we'll get to that in a moment. But if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. And welcome to everyone else who's also watching. So, um, okay, show us, show us a picture of your family, if you would, Matt, because this is not just Levi. It's not just that you have one child. You have three children. That's your gorgeous wife, and which we mentioned before, um, she's a teacher. And so one of you, I'm guessing, went with Levi to the hospital and the other person, the other parent went home. And then what happened? Yeah, so we both, you know, grandma came around to watch uh, Lydia. Veronica was actually pregnant with Tobias at the time, our, our other little yeah. one here. Um, so yeah, um, Veronica's mum come around to look after Lydia and, and we took Levi up to the hospital. Um, and so for both of us, we kind of, it was, yeah, like I said, at this point, we still hadn't been able to do a ketones check for him. Uh, we got to the triage at the hospital and the doctor had rung ahead and it was quite busy. They were, you know, ramping people at the, the hospital that night. And um, the, the, um, the triage nurse did a finger prick test. And again, we were still sitting at 31 point something at that point, but her ketone test failed. So we still couldn't get a ketone reading for him. Um, and I knew they were trying to do it, but at that point I didn't understand what, what they were checking that for. But they, ahead of all of the, everybody, we were actually whisked straight into the emergency room, straight into a, a you know, the resource room was the only one that they had available. They put us straight in there. Like it was kind of, he was priority one, which you know, just made again that, that, that idea of that this is a huge deal hit home. Um, I think it was probably in the early hours of the morning before we finally got up to the, the pediatrics ward. Um, and at that point, Veronica went home and I stayed on one of those lovely couches next to the, next to the bed for a while. Um, and yeah, we were, that was a Tuesday night. We were in hospital until the, the Saturday that week, getting used to the, how to, how to 
manage diabetes from there forward. Yeah, it's funny. Um, skipping the queue or being led into the front of the queue is always a good thing, except for when you're at hospital. Yeah. That's not that's not ideal, not no. ideal at all. Okay, no. so when when did you realize that you needed some way to track or to manage what you know ar- some things around diabetes for Levi? Um, it was probably as we were getting close to him starting school or starting kindy in. in at the beginning of 2019. So, I mean, you, you track and manage everything. I mean, between him getting diagnosed and being at kindy, we'd been back to hospital a couple of times, just, you know, we'd had a wheezing episode that led to troubles and that kind of, And so you're always tracking every every blood and sugar reading and everything that you took. Um, and how you know, were you doing at, at first? Were you just writing that down or were you keeping a spreadsheet or what were you doing? Oh, so we, you get a management book. We were writing it down. So they have a, an, an MDI, which means multiple daily injection, which was our management method at the time you had a, a log book for writing every reading you would do a, a finger prick test every two hours um, including at half past two in the morning because that was when his basal insulin was at its peak so yeah one of us was up at 2 30 every every morning to do that um, and so it was all written down but I mean I very quickly me being me I very quickly found an app that we could record it in uh, but it was still manual data entry and that kind of thing uh, and then we come, we, we got access to continuous glucose monitoring uh, probably a couple of months in. It probably, we didn't have to wait, I, I guess, too long. It felt like a long time, but it, it really wasn't that long between diagnosis and getting a CGM. Um, and that meant a lot less finger pricking um, and the ability to um, not only monitor him constantly using this, this um, implanted monitor, but that we can actually monitor him remotely as well. So um, when he's at school, we can see what his levels are doing and that kind of stuff. But as he was starting, um, getting ready to start kindergarten, we just realized there was, there was just an awful lot of information um, and just trying to put together for the teachers something that um, could give all of the critical information they needed to know for him. Um, you know, doctor's contacts, our emergency contacts, all of that kind of stuff. And um, we had, um, some other educational material in there. So links to YouTube videos. You know, there's a, when, you, when the child's diagnosed with diabetes, the, up here at Rocky Hospital, at least they get you to watch this really crude video or really cool video called uh, Dr. or Professor Bumblebee's Guide to Diabetes or something. It's a little, little cartoon character walking you through what diabetes is and this thing. So I threw that in there for the school so they could get that background understanding. And so it really just... Um, this knowing that there was so much information to pass on, I just wanted to have this really easy reference sheet online, so to speak, that, that people could turn to. Um, and so, yeah, I think I put that together like the night before we went to meet with his with his school teacher for, for his kindergarten year. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so that was the first kind of tech solution to not only tracking, but to sharing information with others. Yeah, it was um, it was a really crude kind of membership based thing that I backed onto ClickFunnels at the time, the, the sales funnel software I was using, and um, it, it was really when you look at it now, it was really quite dodgy. I, I've actually taken it down now. I wish I had some screenshots of it to show just how how, how it looked like the internet of 1995. I think, but it worked. <laughs> I'm sure your teachers, the teachers, were very very grateful for the information. So, so talk to us more about what diabetes is and what numbers you do have to track or what's meaningful. Yeah, so there's a few, I mean, there's a lot of information you're doing. Statistics I've heard is that with, with somebody with diabetes will make an additional 150 decisions a day as opposed to somebody who doesn't have diabetes. Wow. So it is, it's a pretty incredible load. Um, so you're obviously, the, the big one that pretty much everybody knows is you're, track, you're tracking um, blood sugar levels. So yeah. effectively what, what type one diabetes particularly is, it's the, the pancreas doesn't make the, the uh, cells that reg- regulate your insulin. So it doesn't produce insulin. And so your body's not able to regulate its own blood sugar levels um, and you need insulin to absorb the blood sugar. Otherwise it just keeps going around and around and around and, and, and all sorts of nasty things happen. Um, and so monitoring what blood sugar levels are so that you can you know, obviously administer the right level of insulin or the right food or, or, and that kind of thing. Um, they're the key things. So, you know, we're monitoring what his blood sugar levels are, how much insulin to give, when they last had insulin, how certain foods are going to affect you. Um, they're the kind of really key things. And then on a, a bigger level, there's something called a HbA1c, which uh, I guess a, a sort of crude definition would be that it's like a long-term average of your blood sugar level. Um, you know, the actual medical professionals, if anyone's watching, will know that that's not the exact right description of what it is, but it's kind of a crude way to think of it, that that, that is a, like, a, like a long-term average. Cool. Okay, so what did you do next? 
So you went from that very first like MVP almost putting all the information together for school teachers. And then how long did that go for? How long did you use that form or, or that monitoring system? Uh, probably right through his kindergarten year. Well, actually we used it at the start of prep this year to give the information. So even his, his prep teachers now still have the printed out information that we've taken from that website. So right into school this year, that was still our main information portal for him. Um, and, you, and, you know, like I said, the, the information is still in use, even if the website itself has been, has been pulled down at the moment. Um, and that's because we're transitioning it over into the, the new platform now. But it, when we, or what the next step was, I guess, was when I first did the website up, I wanted to make sure that it was the right information that we were giving um, to the school. And so I sent it off to uh, Lisa, our diabetes educator, and I sent it off to uh, Levi's um, endocrinologist or the, the pediatric specialist that we see at the hospital. And I just asked them, can you just have a look at this? Please make sure I haven't put in any wrong information. Is there anything missing that you think a teacher needs to know? Um, you know, is, do you think this is a useful resource before we go and foist it upon the school? In a month? Because, you know, schools are already and teachers are already overloaded with stuff. So you know, is yeah. this useful for them? Um, and it was in a conversation, I think, with Lisa at the time where she said, you know, we're, you know, I, I want every patient of mine to have something like this and using something like this. And, you know, the, you, you could turn this into a business and, you know, you know me well enough to know that as soon as that word was mentioned, the light bulb went on. Um, and so thus began the journey of going, okay, how do I commercialize this? Um, because I was, I, I sat down and thought, well, I know that, you know, for, for diabetes, a lot of the stuff that get, particularly at Levi's age, like his continuous glucose monitoring, which could run to about $8,000 a year is fully subsidized until he turns 21. Um, you know, a lot of other stuff is subsidized to a certain degree until he turns 21. But once you hit that magic age of 21, uh, particularly if you don't have a, you know, don't qualify for a Commonwealth healthcare card, managing your diabetes becomes a lot more expensive, particularly if you want to continue on with, you know, CGM, which is all he's known. Um, and particularly by the time he gets to that age. So it doesn't get to American levels of stupid, but it does definitely get more expensive. And so for me, I think, well, if we can commercialize this into a business, that, that can allow me to build a slush fund for him that's going to help him to pay for whatever it takes to manage his health for the rest of his life. And then I sat back when he thought of the commercial scope, well, actually, you know what? We can make a lot more than we need just for him. We can help a lot more people with the money we can make out of this. Um, and, it, and so that, that dream was now born to make this a commercially usable platform uh, that we can then use to help people all around the world get access to care and education that they otherwise wouldn't get access to. Yeah, what a fantastic vision and what a beautiful leap just from what does um, Levi's teacher need to how can we help this, how can we help on a global scale? And um, in the startup world, there's this um, kind of approach where you solve a local pro problem and then you expand that to the global uh, pro into, into the globe, into an international market. And I think this is a beautiful example. Okay, so once you came up with that vision, what did you do next? Did you go and seek a developer? Did you like draw something out? What did you do? Um, I guess for me, the, the first thing we did was just kind of get inside the brain space and figure out, okay, how do, I, how do I make this work? I mean, this is built on the back of my own sales funnel platform right now. There's no way I can make this some kind of what you call multi-tenant infrastructure where different users have their own versions of the same thing. So this won't work for anyone but yeah. me. How do I take it and make it work for someone other than me and, and, a, and a, a bigger scale? Um, and I tossed around with the idea, how would I make it work? How would I price it? How would I this, that, the other? Um, and then I started to get serious when I sat down one day with one of our other, uh, you know, genius members in the Smart Hub, Phil Martin, and said, Phil, this is what I'm thinking. And even then I was still very vague, you know, sort of what am I really trying to build here? And I said, this is what I'm thinking, Phil. And I kind of, we tried to sketch down this module based kind of thing. And this is what it looks like. How do we do it? Um, and he was really helpful with helping me understand what we could probably do and how we could get a, an MVP built pretty quick and easy. Um, and because for me, then it was okay, what's it going to take to develop? How do we do it? And even though at this point, I'm not going to be the person that's developing it because I had, you know, I can do a lot of things, but coding and developing is not one of them. And, um, and so I was, but I wanted to know, at least know how. Uh, and so I was researching what it would take and that would help me understand what it would cost and a lot of those kind of factors. And I believe it, it was in a, the first time I come across sort of what led me down the path we're on now was a, a conversation um, possibly with Daniel um, where he pointed out the, the something got the 100 days of no code um, opportunity, um, which got the bubble platform, um, brought the bubble platform to my awareness. I'm not sure if he'd mentioned bubble to me before because we you know, we've all heard of Daniel's read with Lolly that he's building on bubble. 
Um, and so I'm not sure whether he'd mentioned Bubble to me previously or it was the 100 days of no code come first and he pointed out Bubble in there. I, I can't remember how that conversation went, but that's what led me to Bubble. And I remember sending it to Phil going, Phil, would this work? Could, could we build it using this platform? And we'd looked at a couple of other open source options that were around to start building a base. And, and he said, I sent it to Phil. I said, Phil, would this work? And, and he said, yeah, you, you absolutely could use that to build it. And I think um, just to segue a little bit, that's a, a great testament to the kind of relationships we have here in the hub and how good like Phil's a software developer. He could easily have said, no, you need me to build it for you. But yeah. he didn't. He went, you know, th that would work for you. And then he, he not only did that, he sent back two or three more options and go have a look at this platform and this platform and this platform. So um, that was how we got down this, the pathway to where we are now. You know, we went from sitting down with Phil on a notepad to I can build this thing myself, at least to get it started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I can just quickly highlight the fact that that is what the Smart Hub does so well. That's why the community is so powerful and collaboration is key. And so you can went from having a problem to having an idea to being able to actually discuss that with people in the know. And then you came to the solution, which yeah. is bubble.io. Hey, Steve, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you have any questions for Matt, please feel free to ask. Okay, so show us then instead of going down, you know, getting a developer on board, you decided to go with Bubble. Um, yeah. Show us, show us, what did you build? Oh, well, not what you built, but how you built it. This is how much I can show you of what I've built so far. Um, so we've had, there's actually a lot going on behind here, but the reason I can't show you in behind there is I know you and Elise, you and I have discussed this today, um, is that a lot of uh, what we're building in diabetes dashboard isn't highly technical it pulls a lot of things together and presents them in a way that's helpful and you know uses alerts and messages and those kind of things but um at the moment because there's one particular feature uh, that i've actually come up with myself and I'm, I'm quite happy that i managed to program it to make it to work the way i want to and everything that was a little bit more in depth than i was doing uh, my my ip specialist has said to me please don't show anybody what you're doing just for now <laughs> uh, and so i can't actually get in behind this screen for now but what we're using is this platform called bubble and um, Bubble is a no-code app development platform. So you can see there's Diabetes Dashboard down there. That's 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 where we're going through to, to build the, the app. Um, and you can see- Looks like you've been building other things as well. I've been playing Not just around. building, yeah. I've been playing around with a couple of things. This is my sandbox here where I basically just play with little things. That when I think, you know, would this work? I go in and try and create it in this little sandbox tool. And um, But if we have a look, so just the other day on a webinar with Startup Gladstone as part of Gladstone ICT Week, we actually sat down and built let's try and knock together our own contact tracing app. Um, and so this was in about 40, 40 to 45 minutes with the Mac completely freezing up somewhere in the middle of the live presentation. So you, as you can imagine, it's not gonna, it's not gonna look overly pretty because we don't have a lot of time to do designing and that sort of stuff. But by the time that, that webinar alone was over, what we had in Bubble was this app where you could do your contact tracing um, set up it would allow you to submit the form as long as you had a first name a surname and then one of the three boxes filled um, it would collect the information into a back-end database for you um, and then we'd have a, a another page where you could uh, just a second to get there i'm just going to have to move some of this the zoom stuff um, you know it had another page where you could actually pull the reports of um, of who had checked in um, so when somebody had to pull that data out and and you know it seems pretty straightforward but this is something we knocked together in 45 minutes and so this same platform is what I'm actually using to build diabetes dashboard. Um, particularly helpful is it's got a really, really big range of plugins. So um, obviously when we were building an app in 45 minutes, we hadn't gone down the plugin rabbit hole, but all the things that we need to help pull in information from Levi's continuous glucose monitoring. So, you know, we're able to use the, use the, their, their API to pull that data in to, to diabetes dashboard which for us will not only allow it to present that data, because remember, we want it to be an all-in-one all place management platform. Like if you want to do anything to manage your diabetes, you just use this app and it branches out from there. That, that's what we want this to be. Um, and so it can pull that information in um, and display it, push out notifications. So it's same, the same as the alerts that we have um, now when alarms go off, um, can do its own maths to, to point out you know, trends and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we've been able to plug all that in to Bubble, which we really made using just drag and drop information. Um, we're able to, by just, we can make it interact with uh, either things like Amazon AWS or Google's Firebase, which is just like the back end database, so to speak. Because um, one of the things when you're dealing with health information is we've got to be careful about how we encrypt the data and you know, a customer service person that might work for us 
can't actually get in and see your personal data. Yeah, and um, also where it's stored. Yeah, yeah, and we have, and you do, you have where it's stored issues. So by de by default, when you're you're working with a bubble app, they they have an inbuilt database function, but that's on a server in the United States. So when you're dealing with the Australian privacy principles, or you're dealing with clients in the EU, that's probably not going to cut it. So even that ability to just go, well, this person's registered in Australia, so we can store it on an Australian database. This person's registered. And even though that does require connecting Bubble to something else to do that, it's still really, really, really simple to do. And so, yeah, it's given this platform that we can just get in and, and, and do all of that myself. So, okay, so instead of going down um, hiring a developer, yeah. you decided to use Bubble and you've built the dashboard and it actually sits behind this icon. And the only reason why you're not clicking on that little box over there yeah. is because there, it's currently being patented. Really, yeah. that's that's the bottom that's line, right? right? And so we yeah. can't publicly display it, but when the yeah. patents go through, then we'll definitely have another, have another go yeah. at showing it. But let yeah. me ask you this. So how much has it cost to create the diabetes dashboard? Time, really what it's cost me to get to where I am now is almost nothing um, because even some of the so with thanks to again something that comes through that hundred days of no code platform with bubble you don't pay for your app until it's live so you can build it for free you pay for it once you want it to go live and you, you take a certain subscription and you want to move it onto your own domain but you know thanks to that introduction through the hundred days of no code I got access to five hundred dollars worth of free bubble subscription time so right now even though that is live and is on a a low end paid subscription, I'm still not paying for it. I'm still working through the, the credits I had. Um, and through access to things like the, the AWS Activate program with Amazon, you get you know, credits there. So I'm still living out the, the benefits that startup founders get access to in all of these different areas. And I, I've paid nothing but time up to this point and a little bit of advertising in my market research. I, I spent some money to gather some, uh, some people to help me with market research. But otherwise, there's not much. Um, and just to backtrack how we come on to Bubble, and I remember it, it may not have been Daniel that mentioned it, although we've talked about it a lot, but actually I had looked down, you know, going back to the expense that I was concerned of, it was of building it. Um, you triggered the, the memory when you asked, what's it cost to this point? But um, I was going down the path of actually trying to crowdfund it. Um, and I thought, well, if I can try and raise maybe a million bucks crowdfunding, that's going to really help get it built I can hire a couple of developers or maybe I can hire Bitplex and they can do what I want them to do but mm. um and so I was in a conversation with um uh, with Michael Norton who we've had a little bit to do with in the smart hub when he was here operating from from Bundaberg um and he'd been involved in crowdfunding and that and I sort of we were talking through how to do it and he said well why, why don't you just use one of these no-code platforms and build something and then sell something instead you know crowdfund it by just selling it um, and that, that's where, that's what sort of triggered us down this journey. And then obviously Daniel and I have had numerous conversations ever since about, about using the platform. So um, yeah, that was how we went. But so long way of saying how much have we spent to date? Very, very little so far. Okay, very good. But you're actually using it, right? Levi's information is being tracked on Bubble or on your diabetes dashboard as it exists just behind that icon there. That's correct. Levi is the only person whose information is being tracked on it, but he, his information is being used to, to test how it works and make sure it works and see where things break. Um, you know, things do break. Um, you know, you can change one thing and break three others. Um, yeah. So, but it, um, it, it's, it is tracking his information and pulling his information in. Yeah. That's awesome. And we had a conversation just before about you um, giving your doctor a printout. Tell me more about that. Tell me that story again. Yeah. So we go every quarter, we go to the, um, to see the, the pediatric specialist at, um, up at the hospital to the um, pediatric diabetes clinic. And so for me, again, just thinking through the easiest way to give them the information they want, sat down in the early days and, and put together just a sort of one page report of the basic information they needed to know from Levi. You know, what was the HbA1c last visit? What is it now? Um, you know, what was our dosing ratios last visit? What are they now? Space for the doctors to write some notes, just that everyday basic stuff. Um, and turns out I'm the only person that was doing that, um, which they all liked because it just made, you know, all the information you needed was right there. So you, you could, we could get into what mattered really, really quickly. Um, and along with the reports from his CGM tracker, which would give trends and all those kind of things, which were really good for the doctor to see. Um, the last time at the clinic, that changed from the one that I was doing using a rolling Google document to actually giving them a printed out report that we had pulled from diabetes dashboard that had pulled in the information that I put about Levi and pulled in um, CGM data and, and wrapped it into a, a report that I produced in PDF and printed out and took to them. 
Um, so yeah, they were, they were pretty excited to see that. They knew I was working on the project in the background, but to actually see a report that we'd produced out of it. And for me to actually hand over a report to them that produced out of it, probably for me, even that, at that moment, it started to feel a lot more real. Oh, awesome. And they were super impressed. That's what I'm, I'm that's what's really obvious. Yeah. So thankfully I've got, you know, that um, his, his doctor is now saying, you know, once we're ready, he's going to try and link it in with his, his colleagues in the United Kingdom and all sorts of things. So yeah, they were, they were pretty happy with, with what we were putting together. Awesome. Okay. So what's the next step? So you have the dashboard and then um, lastly, I'm going to ask you to kind of summarize the steps from where you become aware of a problem. So we commercialize that, but let's just step through the steps one by one as we go. Yeah. So what's the next step? for you now that you have this established we're working with an ip lawyer we're waiting for that to go through what's the next step so the next step for me once the the ip lawyer gives the sort of tick to say okay we're, we're, we're good to actually let people see it again um is to try and, and round up our first group of say what we might call uh, our beta testing group so actually get some users in and get them using it and um finding the bugs before we try and launch it at scale and then it, then it comes down to the real fun part which is getting into the marketing and launching the product um, and so for me, um, I think you and I talked about this off camera for me, uh, the, the 5th of June, 2021 would be the three year anniversary of Levi's diagnosis. I, I would love to have it launched by then, maybe not on that date, but by then that day, um, that, and that's done a round of beta testing and launched it. But you know, obviously with things, you know, we could get into beta testing and all sorts of things could break and that could push it back, but that's, that would be the goal. So how many beta testers do you need? To be honest, I don't know. Um, probably, probably a good crowd, um, and I would like, you know, to get some from obviously here in Australia, um, from overseas as well. Um, we certainly want to test that, you know, that the idea that if you sign up in Australia, your data goes here, and if you sign up in the UK, your data goes there. Um, I can use VPNs to man manipulate that a little bit, but we still want to see that it's it's working properly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, a nice round figure is you say, let's, let's try and get a thousand people using it, but I don't know. We'll see. And how do you think you'll go about getting people onto the platform, even in this beta stage? Um, probably, so, probably social media is probably going to be the main channel. Um, there, there's two options. We can go down the social media path or what I, uh, I may do is, is try and, and look to medical professionals. One of the things I, I say as a business coach is to talk to you know, find somebody that can send you 10 clients instead of you trying to find 10 individual clients yourself. Um, and so that could mean going through and talking to maybe it, it's people like diabetes educators who, who might be able to recommend to, to clients. But um, for me, I've still got to understand how that legal area works. And, and, you know, there could be implications for people trying to recommend products and those kind of things. So um, just researching that. So for me at the moment, social media is my thought because it's where I play pretty well already. Um, but there may be that opportunity to actually look to speaking with people that are in um, the, the diabetes education and diabetes um, management areas and saying, you know, would you have clients who might like to use this, uh, um, which again, you know, one person can connect you to 100 rather than trying to find 100 individuals. Um, and I guess that's a probably a good point to point out too, that the, the, it's got use, uses for not just the person with diabetes, but we actually want diabetes educators using it to, to monitor all of their clients. So um, and we want you know, medical professionals using it to, to monitor all of their clients. So it's going to have uses for the person with diabetes plus the people right throughout their care network. So um, we, we want to get people beta testing it. it you know, when, we have, when we're ready to go, as far as Levi is concerned, we'll want his diabetes educator and his doctor and his school teachers using it because it'll have the functionality that if, we have, if Levi had a, as a problem one night or we'd make a change to his insulin, just like sending a tweet, I'll be able to jump in and say, change Levi's insulin to this. And everybody that's following him will get a notification to know that we've made a change to his insulin. And so be aware that he may have changes to what his blood sugar levels look like that day. Um, and so, you know, for, from a, a diabetes educator's perspective, we want it to be a case of if they've got a hundred clients who all use it, they can log in at the start of the day and see a feed of all the updates for those clients. Um, you know, we, we want to go down the pathway of using it so you can actually, again, it's all in one place. So we want to be able to get doctors on board that people can book appointments through the platform and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, again, for the medical professionals, when, they, when Levi transitioned from injections, you know, seven injections a day to an insulin pump, we were on daily phone calls with the diabetes educator because it's just that transition. So we want it to be a case where, okay, perhaps in that circumstance in future, the diabetes educator could actively follow 
the person who's just had an insulin pump set up for the next week or two weeks and actually get notified when there's an alarm because he's had a low or and, and that and but then you know for an educator that might have a, a huge swag of clients if they had alarms going off for every client it would they would just be bombarded constantly with mm. with alerts so the the ability for them to customize you know, just time frames. I need to follow this person actively and get all their alerts for two weeks, three weeks because of this transition. Um, and so we, when it comes to the beta testing, we need kind of people from that group and schools and teachers that have got children with diabetes and doctors. And so, yeah, it's not just the number, it's we need a real eclectic mix of people as well. Mm, awesome, awesome, awesome. Hey, DB, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as you know, we're talking to Matthew Doyle. We're talking about the diabetes dashboard that he's created in uh, using a uh, platform called bubble.io. And you'll see, I think there's a link in the comments on Facebook and how he's built this entire dashboard um, really using no money at all, only just what he's learned um, from managing his son who has who suffers from uh, type 1 diabetes and just from playing around on, in bubble. That, that's fair, right? That's a fair comment. There's been a whole lot of playing around going on. It's, it's just began to work, yeah. Yeah, and the work and the effort that you've put in yourself, yeah. Yeah. which is really cool. Okay, excellent. So what would the next step be? So after beta, what happens yeah. then? Well, obviously we need to fix any problems <laughs> that we find during the beta testing before going live. So. Uh, find any problems, take user feedback, um, particularly look at anything that we've, you know, that maybe has come from market research that we think that needs that nobody uses. So um, we'll, we'll be analysing quite heavily how it's used, uh, what features don't get used, what do get used, um, what's, what might be missing, anything that breaks, um, does the, you know, do we have enough capacity to handle the load? Um, as far as, you know, if we get a thousand people using it and it breaks because of the server load, then we obviously haven't bought enough server capacity, uh, all of those kind of fun and games. Uh, for me, probably bouncing off a few people with a bit more technical knowledge than myself at this at that point as well, um, at, you know, and, and working with them with the technical data that we gather. Um, and then it's, you know, once we've analysed the data, uh, made any choices, then we, we go down the pathway of looking at how we're uh, getting a launch ready. Okay, excellent. And then that launch will be, I'm guessing, a, a social media launch and also, as you said, a network launch, i.e. Yeah. talking to diabetes educators, um, healthcare professionals and getting the word out that way. Yeah, that's right. And then obviously just because we're, um, you know, because we're a startup and startups do the whole launch party fun thing, we'll, we'll do some kind of actual launch event as well, which, Yay, which will be really we'll cool. Yeah, we'll do that at the Smart Hub, which will be awesome. We'll have to yeah. have a really big party, which will so be it'll, really good. It'll be really cool to stand up and say, look, we just built this in, in Rocky, you know, uh, and that will be really cool, yeah. That will be really cool. Okay, and so um, if people are interested in being a beta tester, how can they get in contact with you? So, I mean, if you go to the, the, the website, diabetes-dashboard.io, which is where it will be, um, you can, on this particular page, you can see there's a box here that says click here to be first in line. Um, and, it, and it's, you're just simply saying, yes, I want to be first in line to try out diabetes dashboard. Um, name and email is all we need. Um, and we, you know, give us permission to contact you. Obviously by ticking that box there, click join the waiting list and that's what it'll do. It'll put you straight onto our waiting list. Um, that's excellent. We'll, we'll probably come back to you not long afterwards, just to, with a quick little survey and say, can you tell us like sort of not who you are, but you know, are you a person with diabetes? Are you a diabetes educator, et cetera? Because we need to, to map that information. Um, and then if once you're on that waiting list, that's all it will take for us. To, as soon as we're ready to get some people in to invite some people in for beta testing it, we'll send you an email. Oh, excellent. Okay, so if someone has a problem at the moment or they have an idea on how to solve something that's not ideal in their lives, what can you summarize the steps that you need to take? Well, the first step I think is defining the problem, um, particularly when it comes down to when it comes down to building an, an app and that kind of thing. People go, oh, that'd be great to be an app for that. And you can go a long way down building an app and realize I never really defined the reason this, this app to build this app. There's one, one thing that one quote that stands out in my mind from an event we did in Gladstone with Steve Baxter back when he was the uh, chief entrepreneur for Queensland. And a lot of people were talking about solving problems by building apps. And Steve stood up and he said, if the answer is an app, what's the expletive problem? And, mm. and so it's, you know, start with defining the app, uh, defining the app, defining the problem first, because sometimes we, what we think is a problem is not the actual problem. So we need to define the, the problem that we're solving first and then explore what are our options to solve that problem. So, you know, we look at diabetes dashboard. It was, it really started out, the problem started out with, 
we've got a, a ton of information to share that we want to try and distill down and make it readily available. It, it started out as a, a couple of, an information and education page um, and then evolved from there because we realized that there were other problems we could solve by bringing everything together into one place. But so, you know, what, what, what is the problem? What are the options we have to solve that problem? And what's the best, the best method or best mode? Because you know, an app might not be the best mode. You know, if we look at um, you know, what we call my, my day job, so to speak, with my other business, where we've gone into business and leadership coaching in the NDIS, a problem there was that there was an awful lot of people in this space that had very little business knowledge and they were suffering because of it. Um, and so you know, we mapped out, this is what the problem is. Um, potential solutions to the problem, which was down the path of creating a, a business coaching platform or program for, for people in that space. Now, if I'd have gone, let's build an app, that wouldn't have worked for them. Um, and so, yeah, it's def defining the problem and, and actually asking, is this the right solution? And, and then you get in building and testing and building and testing and um, making sure that you are defining who you're solving the problem for, not just, um, again, with an app like this, I could build it for what I want and then find nobody else wants it. Um, so mm, you've mm. really got to know who, um, and again, with an app like this, I've got a bunch of different target markets. I've got people with diabetes, but then I've got their parents and carers and I've got their medical professionals and I've got their teachers. And so these are all different customers and we're actually trying to build it for all of them in, in different ways. So making sure you know who you're building it for, what their problem is, how you solve that problem, are all critically important. Yeah. And then the next step would be go to a no code or whatever the solution is, how you can build the solution, build something that is an MVP, build something that is simple, that can get the job done. It's not the ultimate pro um, uh, product. It's just something that you can use to test. Absolutely, it gets something built that's in the marketplace and something like Bubble, really, really easy to use. I mean, there's th things like AppGyver that are quite good as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, Bubble is probably the easiest to use as far as not just setting it up nicely and visually. Like if we, if we come back to this little app here, like you can see how easy this platform is just to just drag and drop stuff and fill in the blanks and, and that. So it's very easy to use. It's very easy to use from, you know, the workflows in the background to make it do what you want it to do. Um, and so what that allows you to do is to get something out really, really quickly. Um, so you're not going through sort of years of ideas and development. And, and what it really allows you to do is if, it, if your app idea or your idea is going to fail, it's going to allow you to fail really fast and really cheap because you're yeah. going to be able to build it nice and easily, get it out there, find nobody likes it, nobody wants it, nobody uses it. Whereas the old way to do it might have been to spend, you know, try and find investors and spend millions of their dollars building something that ultimately fell over. Yeah. Okay. And then the next step is get some beta testers on board, test whether it works well, fix the problems, which they'll inevitably there'll be problems. Yep. And then roll out to market through proper medium, um, proper marketing, social media marketing, or whatever right. marketing it is that's appropriate for your for your product. That's exactly right. Yep. And of course, all these steps along the way, you don't have to do it like I've done, which is effectively do it myself. You can, but again, I've spoken to people that have helped and advised and, and steered me on the journey, but you know, bring people, bring other people in to, to do, to help you with the marketing, you know, if you're, um, but definitely, you know, going down this path with this no code tool will let you shape what the vision that you have in your mind um, and produce a product that ultimately looks exactly what like you would had envisioned rather than sending your idea to somebody else and not liking what comes back to you. Mm. Um, but yeah, so once you get to that point, then it's, you go from building an app to now I'm a marketing and salesperson. Um, and then you happen to, from, from then on in, you are a marketing and salesperson who just happens to build and develop an app as well. And after that, essentially, you're building a company on the back of the marketing and sales that you're doing. Then you start right. building the real business. That's right. Then you're building a team and a company and, a, and absolutely. Um, adapting and adding things yep absolutely it reminds me of something that dr sarah pearson said when she was here um, the deputy director general uh, for innovation at advanced queensland she said that in the same way as it takes a village to raise a child it actually takes a village to raise a successful company and it's extremely difficult for one person in isolation to have an idea and to take that idea to market um, in any product and service in any meaningful way and i think that's uh, and i'm not trying to plug the smart up uh, this might seem like a 
shameless plug, but it really isn't. It's just the reality of the situation that you actually do need other people. And the more people you talk with and speak with and discuss your ideas with, the better um, solutions you find and the more uh, traction you get, the quicker you can get to a solution that's actually going to work. And so the question is, where can you find a group of people that actually have this knowledge? And the place where you can find this group of people is the Smart Hub. And um, I heard someone say recently that uh, maybe if, you, if you're not connected to the Smart Hub at the moment, that it looks like we're um, like a, a clique of people or a community of people that's not very welcoming. You know, we talk about um, startup, we talk startup language and jargon and we talk technology. And that is actually the exact opposite of what it is to be part of our Smart Hub community. I think we are one of the most welcoming, inclusive communities out there. We love to see people succeed. We we don't speak jargony language at all. We're just normal people um, helping and supporting each other every day and doing our best and really, really there as a community to give ideas, to give introductions to other people or to do whatever's required for everybody in this in the space and beyond to succeed. Would you agree that that would be a fair, as a member, is that a fair comment? Is that a fair summary of what the Smart Hub community is like? Yeah, 100%. And, you know, again, you know, whether it's giving feedback or just co informal conversations that you and, have, you and I have had all the time, it always comes back to the most valuable part of that is the community. Yeah, and as we've told the story today, there's discussions with Phil, discussions with Daniel, discuss these are just things that happen because we're here, because we're in this, this community. Um, and so I, I would echo that 100%. Yeah. And so if and, and I always kind of cringe when people say, oh, people are here because of the community. But what that actually means is just being present in the lunchroom mm -hmm. and saying, hey, what are you up to? And what are you up to while you make a coffee or bumping into each other in the hallway? Like it's just normal conversation between normal human beings around the projects that people are working on. And everyone here is so giving. And this, that is our culture. Give first. Everyone's so, so giving, knowledgeable and really, really there to help so yeah if you're interested in the smart hub or being part of this community please reach out either through our facebook page or send us an email or you can even give us a call or just walk through the front door here at 208 key street in customs house where which is where you are matthew you're sitting in your office right. we're, we're playing a game of upstairs downstairs i'm downstairs <laughs> that's in right i'm in my office upstairs, upstairs in the, you're yeah. in your office downstairs uh, that's really really cool um is any last words of wisdom um I think what, the, as far as this kind of thing goes, the, the, the fact is it's really, really easy to try these days and not have to spend a lot of money. So if you've got that idea that you think this would make a really good thing, um, I think it would work really well. It's really, really easy to try. And if it fails, it fails, but it's really easy to try without spending a whole lot of money. Uh, with, and that wasn't the case not so long ago. Now right. it's really, really easy to have a go. Um, and I do have one other shameless plug that I'm going to slot in there all of my own. <laughs> okay. And, and of course, Jacinta's looked at my shirt, but um, before, before we came live, but the shirt I'm wearing, of course, is the JDRF one walk shirt. And anybody that's not familiar with JDRF is um, it's the juvenile diabetes research foundation. So, you know, we have reaped a lot of benefit from them. Um, you know, they are the ones that organized a funded insulin pump for Levi. They are the ones that had some really great information and resource for us in the early days. Last year, we had the, the privilege of hosting for them a, their, their one walk event right here in Rocky, where we had 50 people come together and walk and raise just over $5,000 uh, for JDRF as part of their one walk, which is done in October every year. Uh, this year, we can't do that live in, in person. So we're doing a virtual walk and I, I'm walking again and Veronica's walking again. So this is a shameless plug to say, I would absolutely love it if you could sponsor us on that walk um, to help us raise money for people that are helping kids like Levi every single day. Um, and so if you want to do that, um, just go to walk.matthew.org.au and it will redirect you to their fundraising page. Um, and you Perfect. can see, I do have a photo here. That's, that's the group from last year. So. Oh, that's really awesome. Every, we'll put that link in the comments too. Every every orange hat there is actually someone who has type 1 diabetes. Wow. And you can't actually see many in that photo, but there's a, there's a couple. There's Levi and a couple of other kids there. Yeah, so that's cool. So yeah. I just thought I'd throw that shameless plug in that we didn't discuss beforehand, but... Uh, yeah, you're more than welcome. I think I think it's, it looks like a really worthy cause. Anyway, I think that brings us to the end of our Hub Live for this Thursday. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank you, Matthew Doyle. It was absolutely awesome, as always, to speak with you.